everybody. It's Harvard Lawyer Lee. We have an incredible video for you today. We're, we're going to be talking about the wild, wild trial of the Waukesha Parade defendant, Daryl Brooks. I'm excited to have a very special guest here today. Dr. Shaham Das is with us. He's a forensic psychiatrist out of the UK. He has a great YouTube channel. It's called A Psych for Sore Minds. And welcome. It's an honor to have you back on the channel. Lee, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me back on. And uh, yeah, I'm interested to see what we're going to come up with about Daryl yeah. Brooks. Okay. He's, he's certainly a very, very strange uh, character, definitely. Indeed. And I will say this, the Daryl Brooks trial was bar none, the craziest I've ever seen. And it's left a lot of questions, I think, for people, particularly around the psychiatric issues. Like, was he competent to stand trial? Was he competent to represent himself? And then what should the judge have done during trial when there was all that mayhem going on? What was going on with the guy and the way he behaved? So Dr. Das and I are going to be talking about all of that. And Dr. Das is going to be talking about some of the specific psychiatric issues that Daryl Brooks may be battling and what could explain some of his behaviors, both on the day of the parade and at trial. Now, if you don't know the background, Daryl Brooks was accused and is now convicted of having mowed down a large group of people right in the middle of the Waukesha Christmas Parade. So there were six people who were killed and 60 who were injured when he drove his red SUV right through the middle of the parade. It was right after a fight with his girlfriend, and it was devastating for the community of Waukesha, Wisconsin, because here they were celebrating, having a wonderful time, and then complete, complete horror for all of them. So Dr. Dosh, you are my first and second guest ever. <laughs> what an honor. I'm glad to have you back. And also, if you would, uh, put suggestions in the comments below. If you have ideas for other guests you think would be great on the channel, just let me know. Now, I think the way we're going to kind of work this video is I'm going to layer in videos from the trial. And then we're going to ask Dr. Doss to explain sort of what he sees, how it supports what he's thinking about the defendant, whether it changes his mind as he goes through things like that. Does that sound good? Yeah, it sounds good to me. So I would say that the case is not that big in the UK. Like I've heard of it through YouTube and because I've, I've done stuff on other channels, but uh, compared to, for example, the the Johnny Depp uh, Amber Heard trial, it's got very little attention, which is surprising to me because I, it's actually more fascinating, I think. It is really fascinating. Just the whole conduct of the trial was so outside the realm of what we expect from a trial. So unlike anything that we've seen before, you really need to stick around to the end because at the end, I'm going to show Dr. Doss a couple of new videos that I don't think he has seen before, not very many people have, and I'm going to be asking him what he thinks about those. So you definitely want to hear what he has to say about those, and sorry for the surprise on that, <laughs> but, but I think they'll be really interesting. I think you'll be fascinated to look at those two. One of them is from 2012, and I had not seen it before. The other is from yesterday, so Practically no one will have seen it yet. It's just now hitting all the news. So let's start with Dr. Doss. I know you have a specialty, forensic psychiatry. Can you just tell us real briefly, what does that mean you do? Sure, I'll give you the short version. Uh, so psychiatrist is a medical doctor who deals with people who have a mental illness. Forensic psychiatrist does that, but specifically with people who've committed uh, offences, crimes, usually violent offences. So anything from sexual assaults to, you know, uh, attempted murder to murder. Uh, and I tend to work in courts or in prisons or in psychiatric units. So that's kind of like my core job. But on top of that, I work as an expert witness, which means that I give evidence in criminal trials. I've never had one quite as high profile as Daryl Brooks, but I've certainly seen some people in similar kind of situations who have just very strange presentations and have committed murder. Yeah. There were four different issues that were sort of considered or could have been considered by the court related to psychiatric issues. And we'll talk about those four. I'll be interested to know which ones you normally would deal with and which ones you would not. The first was that Daryl Brooks initially pled guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, often known to other to people as not guilty by reason of insanity. He yeah. withdrew that plea, so the judge never had to consider it. Is that the kind of thing you would normally evaluate in your role? 
Yeah, absolutely. So it is not guilty. We in in UK law, it's not guilty by reason of insanity. I know there's different versions in different states in in the US, uh, and it's a very high threshold, right? So I'm only asked to find it a handful of times, maybe twelve times in a year out of seeing like fifty to a hundred cases. And within those twelve times, I only find it. I only agree with that finding about once or twice. So it's it's, it's really high to meet that threshold. Not only do you have to have a mental illness. But it has to be evident that you were suffering from symptoms at that time. But most importantly, it either meant that you didn't know what you were doing. Like, so, you know, in Daryl Brooks cases, if he literally didn't know that he was driving a car or killing people or that you didn't know what you're doing was wrong. So if he felt compelled to do it because, I don't know, hypothetically speaking, he had these delusional beliefs that these people were assassins and that his life was in danger, you know, the victims. So that is the kind of level of uh, of of psychiatric disorder you have to have to get that kind of psychiatric defense. It's very similar here because it is almost impossible to reach that threshold. And I personally don't see how Daryl Brooks could have reached that threshold with the evidence that was before the court. It seems to me pretty likely he would have been ruled mentally capable of having understood what he was doing. So I don't, I don't think that that plea would have worked for him. So now there are three other decisions that the court actually did have to make. The first one was whether or not Daryl Brooks was mentally competent to stand trial. Was he incompetent so he couldn't even show up at trial? They couldn't try him. Right now, there's another big case in the U.S. of a woman named Lori Vallow who's accused of killing her children. And they keep sending her back for evaluations and for extra mental help because of concerns about that. But with Daryl Brooks there really wasn't a lot of evidence or anything around that. Tell me, is that also the kind of work you would do is around whether or not someone could stand trial? Yeah, absolutely. So in the UK, it's called fitness to plead. And as you say, it's about the ability, like, you know, being cognitively able to understand what's going on is probably the main aspect of that, but also being able to follow evidence, being able to have the presence of mind to uh, to understand if something incorrect is being said and being able to kind of um, uh, reject that or appeal against it, um, being able to actually instruct your solicitors. So if somebody's so mentally disturbed that the solicitor the lawyer can't even you know figure out whether they're trying to plead guilty or not guilty again that's it's a really high threshold uh, so you mentioned Laurie um is it Laurie Vallow yes Did I said that right so I know a little bit about the case but the case that immediately jumps to my mind that your viewers might have heard of and you probably heard of heard of have heard of is um Andrea Yates so she's somebody who murdered her who killed I should say killed not murdered her five children in 2001 uh, and the reason that I bring that up is because she did get found not fit to stand trial and not guilty by reason of insanity. But she had these delusional beliefs that her children were marked by the devil. So she felt compelled to end their lives because she thought she was saving them from the afterlife. So again, I'm just giving your viewers a kind of level of psychiatric disorder. We're not talking about somebody that's a bit argumentative or difficult like Daryl Brooks. It's people that have deep psychotic beliefs and they, they literally are outside of reality. Okay. And it's sim similar here, I think. The second thing that the court actually considered was whether or not Daryl Brooks was capable of representing himself. Now, I don't know if this is a thing in the UK. In the US, you have the right to represent yourself. Is that true in the UK as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you do. There is no psychiatric... So everything you've said so far, there's been an equivalent in the UK. But apart from yeah. this, there is no psychiatric equivalent for deciding whether somebody can represent themselves. There's only fitness to plead. And if you're found fit to plead, then you're automatically assumed to be able to be capable of representing right. yourself. And I think that it's not, I, I may be overstating it to say it's a psychiatric call. I'm not really sure it is. You have the right to represent yourself. And the judge can believe it's a really, really bad idea for you to do that. And yeah. in fact, here, Daryl Brooks' mother wrote the judge a letter and the, said, you know, I don't think my son is capable of representing himself. Could you please not let him do that? And she even said, the judge even said on the record, well, you have, and she listed all these things. And she said to Daryl Brooks, I'm really saying this for your mother. <laughs> because she was saying, I need your mother to understand because she wrote me. And she said, it doesn't really matter whether she understands, but it just mattered to the judge that the mother's concern be addressed. Yeah. Because you know, whether you're good at it or whether you should do that or whether it makes it more likely that you then will go to jail, all of that is irrelevant. Whether you're allowed to do it 
It's just whether you're competent to understand and participate in the court proceedings. Yeah. And that's what, really the only issue. One thing that I would say, Lee, is that from my experience, you know, obviously I give evidence in court. It's, it's very rare for people to represent themselves. And when they do, there's usually some sort of paranoia there. Uh, you know, they're not psychotic. So they're not, you know, they don't have schizophrenia necessarily to the to the point that they're not fit to plead. But there's something about their personality that's really paranoid. So it's usually because they don't trust the system or they don't believe that they're going to be fully represented properly. Uh, and, and I think that's completely relevant to Daryl Brooks. Yeah, very much so. That's that's interesting. So then the fourth decision that the judge made actually had to make the third one she actually had to make is every single day of the trial she had to ask is he representing himself uh, in a way that's so disruptive of orderly procedures that the judge may curtail it that's the standard here in this case she picked the very least restrictive way of doing that she could have curtailed it by saying you're out you get counsel you can't represent yourself anymore and a lot of people might say she should have done that far well, she never did that. They might say she should have. Instead, her view of how she was going to curtail it was if she had to, she moved him to another room and he yeah. had to deal with the trial from the other room. There was a video feed so he could be heard, seen and heard and he could see and hear, but it was not him being in the courtroom. Yeah. So I've got a couple of thoughts about this. Again, from my experience, I've never seen, I, I've occasionally seen people who've been kind of cantankerous and hostile and argumentative occasionally with a judge. There might be like one outburst or a couple of outbursts because, you know, they just can't contain what they see as, as a sense of injustice. But I've never seen anybody do it in a manner that's so repeated and so prolonged and just so rude, <laughs> you know, uh, as Daryl Brooks. So I suppose what that makes me think is is he actually fit to plead so is he such a difficult person that he is choosing to be argumentative or does he have a mental illness that literally compels him he's so paranoid that he's unable to contain himself and i think if i had to choose one i would choose the former so i think he is able to contain himself if he wants to but he is um he's got he's got such a chip on his shoulder and he feels this such a strong sense of injustice that he can't shut up and the other thing i suppose is that if, if from my experience in the UK, and this is exceptionally rare, I've probably only seen somebody this argumentative once, maybe twice in my career. I think they would have shut it down a lot quicker. I think they would have taken him away, said he couldn't represent himself, maybe even questioned whether he's fit to plead or not, got a psychiatric assessment. Uh, but I, I can't imagine a scenario in the UK where they'd let them go into another courtroom, then come back, then he argues and you know shouts and becomes disruptive, then goes back and forth. I can't see that happening. I think the judge would nip it in the bud. Although to to be fair to her, uh, what's the judge's name? Of I, I don't know. Doro. Doro. Uh, to be fair to Judge Doro, I think that the that she's doing her best to give him a chance to represent himself, considering the case is so serious, and because it's under such a big public spotlight as well. I don't think she wants to be seen to be over harsh because that will cut down any chance of success that he might have an appeal and he's clearly somebody who, who would uh, appeal, okay. take a chance of appeal if he could so i think she is probably erring on the side of caution by allowing him to speak more than the average judge would one of the issues in the u.s is that on appeal a defendant is allowed to say that his counsel was not competently representing him that the counsel wasn't good enough and they and somebody can't do that if they've represented themselves they're not allowed to do that so she cut off a lot of what would have been the grounds for appeal by letting him do that but i have never seen a judge put up with that before i mean it was astonishing and i think had some ramifications i wonder what other defendants watching that would think particularly ones with maybe personality disorders different from daryl brooks's yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it's it's possible to get us to set a, quite a worrying president. So the other thing that we should mention is that he identifies as a sovereign citizen, right? So that's quite mm -hmm. an anti-government sort of stance. So there's certainly a pattern of him disregarding and disrespecting the entire kind of government and legal system as a whole. You know, so right. there's. I guess right. what I'm saying is it's not just his behaviour in the courtroom. I think I think there's just it's something much deeper about him. Right. And he wouldn't even answer to his name, if you'll recall. He refused to agree that his name was Daryl Brooks. And she finally called him the person known to the court as Mr. Brooks. It was even to that level where he wouldn't even acknowledge any sort of control over even his name. 
that yeah. wasn't even there. And yeah, yeah. I do want to throw out one thing. A lot of people are saying Darrell Brooks um, instead of Daryl Brooks. I don't know which is, you know, which it is. I did listen to the interview by his mother and his mother called him Daryl. So my view is since he wouldn't acknowledge what his name was, then the mother has the right to say what his name was. She was there. She named him. If she says it's Daryl, I'm going with Daryl. <laughs> and we'll hear her, you know, a little later on in the, in the feed here. Sure. So why don't we take a look at my first video that I have up here from this is, from the trial, it was a really sort of bizarre, surreal situation where Daryl Brooks is once again in the other courtroom all by himself. It's just a couple of bailiffs and Daryl sitting at the table. And then he's doing a video feed into the main courtroom where everything's going on. And all of a sudden he stacks boxes in front of him. So he's got, you know, boxes of pleadings and things like that. And he just stacks them in front of him so he can't be seen. And then the prosecution says, could we have the boxes moved? And the judge says, yeah, like I can't even see him. Like what's, what's going on back there? And, and he loses it, loses it. So let's take a possible for the bailiffs to just move the boxes off the table. So yes, I think that's fair. I'm going to advise the bailiff to remove the box so I can see Mr. Brooks. I don't know what he's doing behind there. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to ask you for a third time. Do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions? Hey, why why are you telling him to move my body? Because I couldn't see you, sir. I've asked you twice now, and I'll ask you a third time. Do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions? Man, you you don't got to talk to me like that. Man, yeah. Yeah, I I got requests. It ain't like they're going to be honest, though. As it not, relates to the jury instructions, sir, what are you? I heard about? what the hell you said, man. Well, Mr. Brooks, that was very disrespectful. Yeah, and, you, and I've been getting disrespected since the beginning of this whole process. So welcome to the club. Mr. Brooks, do you have any I'm requests? I'm tired of my right to be in trouble. I'm sitting here, too. I'm tired of it, too. I can't hear everything. Then you should put the headphones on. What about that? Don't you understand? If you see headphones, you can see everything. You can see buttons, but then you see headphones. Have you you asked for headphones to be provided, sir? I should have to ask for them. I asked for my buttons to be moved. I believe they took them away previously because you were so agitated. They were perhaps afraid you might break them. Yeah, I'm still agitated. I ain't gonna stop being agitated. That ain't gonna stop. You sit up here and do everything you're doing. And think you gonna and think God don't see what you're doing? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Mr. Brooks, do you have any requests as it relates to the jury instructions? Yeah, I, heard, I, I can hear what you're saying. I can hear what you're saying. You just told me you didn't. So which one is yeah, it? Yeah, I got the headphones on. You can't see that? I'm trying to put on this little act like you so worried about what's going on with me. You don't give a damn. Never did. Mr. Brooks, you're being disrespectful again. You've been, you been being disrespectful. You've been being disrespectful. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I was, I was, you know, it's, it's hard not to laugh because it's just so absurd. But then, you know, I keep reminding myself that this is a really serious case. You know, he's killed six people, he's injured so many more. I just it's, it's, to me it has a, another implication. I mean, this is not just about the death of the six people and the sixty injuries. That's critically important, but it's also about the system of justice, and it's about whether that system does work or will work. It's a very fundamental case. But anyway, yeah. I'm real curious to hear what what you have to say. Sure. Well. So I haven't seen that clip before, but I've seen other sort of clips of his behavior. I think he's he's probably more agitated in that clip he just showed me than any other thing that I've seen so far. And I just have to say, like, there's obvious character traits that come out. He's clearly arrogant. He's grandiose. He's narcissistic. He's very entitled. He is extremely kind of argumentative. I think his, his argument, he's so argumentative that it can only be paranoia. Like, I think he really feels wronged. He's not just... You know, some people can be a bit kind of petulant and smarmy, like, you know, your typical kind of teenager or a goth, I don't know. So people that can just be a bit difficult for the sake of it. This is something different to me. This is somebody who really 100% believes that he is the victim here. 
you know, I, I think on, on some level he acknowledges that he's caused the death of all those people. I think he knows that. But I still think despite that, he actually thinks that he's being wronged and he's being disrespected by the judge. It's very bizarre. And I think that he's got a paranoid personality disorder. That's my spot diagnosis. It, that's entirely believable. I will say too, his mother said in a part of the video we're not even going to hear, in one of her interviews, she said, I told him, you're going to have to go to jail. You did this. Yeah. So there's got to be some part of, I mean, he knows he did it. He didn't even really fight that. I mean, he tried various little things like, well, maybe I wasn't driving and little things like that. Maybe, maybe I was trying to have everybody get out of the way by honking. Maybe my vehicle wasn't working, but mostly he kind of acknowledged that he was the guy and that it happened. He didn't fight that as hard as you would think. Yeah. And he made comments, something along the side, along the lines of there were hurt people on both sides. And I think at another point he said, I hope the jury comes to the right decision. So even though he acknowledges that he caused the death of all those people, I think he actually feels in some way justified, uh, or at least that they were mitigating circumstances, which to me suggests there's something fundamentally wrong with his thought processes. You know, the vast majority, well, the vast majority of people wouldn't do that, but if they found themselves in that situation, they would be you know, horrified, they would have deference towards the judge in the court, they would probably do their best to apologize and, you know, to just try and damage control of their own image. But that doesn't seem to be in Daryl's mind at all. He, he seems like completely invested in the in the belief that he that there is injustice with him even being tried. So yeah, I, I definitely think he's got some sort of personality disorder, probably paranoid. Okay. Um, all right, let's layer in another video and and see what you think about this. This was early on in the trial. Brooks has been exiled to the other courtroom. And the behavior is just bizarre. You're just gonna have to you're gonna yeah. have to see it. Sure. Complete and utter disrespect for the simple rules of civility. Um, he has been removed from the courtroom multiple times. This morning alone, I'm told that um, he would not sit down while in this courtroom in order to have the shackles removed so that he could be taken to the other courtroom that he was resisting. Um, that at one point he took off a shoe and it appeared uh, to the deputies that he was going to throw the shoe. Um, you can see that he is seated with his back uh, to the court or to the camera. He took his shirt off as well. I'm also told that he is threatening to throw and break items. So, <laughs> momentarily <laughs> I, speechless on that one. I mean, I, just the concept of someone in court, even if he's in the other room, removing his shirt and turning his back to the court and the jury is bizarre. It's hard to understand. And it's so... It is the opposite of serving his own interests. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, yeah. It's in his interest to be likable, to engage with the judge and the jury. And this is the opposite. And I'll be interested in your take. Yeah. So while I was watching, I have seen that clip before. When I was watching that, I just thought of an, an own story from my own clinic, from my own experience. There's nowhere near as dramatic as this, but I remember it wasn't that long ago. It was about a year ago. There was a court going on, a criminal court for an assault uh, in the court that I was working in. <clears throat> and the, I, what I presume to be the friend of the person that was in the dock, the defendant came into the courtroom and he had this big like McDonald's cup and he was sort of slurping from it. And he had his feet up on the seat and he got bollocked by the judges, you would imagine within the, within, you know, 10 seconds of sitting down. And then he kind of answered back a little bit and sort of, I think he said something like, well, I don't know. Nobody told me I couldn't bring a drink in. And then the judge sort of shouted at him to shut up or get out. And then the judge sort of said, uh, even said to the bailiffs in the room, um, can you go and uh, arrest that man? And then, then the guy quickly put his foot down and, and ran out. Uh, and I think they made a, a, a feeble attempt to chase him, but he just ran out of the courthouse. It wasn't that big a deal, but, that is an example of somebody that doesn't know the etiquette that is being a bit petulant and, you know, misjudged it. And then the judge flexed his powers and then the person scarpered because they realized that they were in trouble. It doesn't even seem to me that Daryl Brooks even has any of that on his mind. It, it's, you know, it, the fact that he's acting so kind of disrespectfully to me again, suggests that he is protesting 
because he genuinely feels wronged. Like, I don't think this is some sort of plea. He's nobody can be that good an actor and just act in such a bizarre way. I think he's highly sensitive and highly paranoid. Uh, and he just, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't believe that he's getting justice at all. And this is just him expressing his frustrations. Um, would it be helpful if I really quickly went through the symptoms of paranoid personality disorder? Absolutely, and then yeah, please. Maybe as, as an outsider, as, as an objective source, you can tell me whether you think from what okay. you've seen this, this, this connects with Daryl. So somebody typically, they don't trust other people, obviously. They generally don't confide, so they don't tell people what they're feeling. Obviously, he wouldn't do that in a court setting anyway, but even to his friends and family. They're quite unforgiving, so they hold grudges, even if it's something you know very minor has been done in the past. They're hypersensitive to criticism, so sometimes if somebody says something even quite neutral uh, or say some, tries to say something as a joke, somebody with paranoid personality disorder will misinterpret that as some sort of veiled insult and will sort of hold a grudge. Uh, they are extremely paranoid, obviously. They're controlling and they're quite sort of jealous in everyday life. They deny responsibility, which I think is a huge, a key uh, factor for Daryl Brooks. And they always believe they're right. So they never are able to take anybody's perspective. And also they're kind of hostile, they're stubborn, and they're generally argumentative. Again, not just sitting in front of the judge, but in every aspect of their life. So that would be the key features. Uh, I think you know more about Daryl Brooks than I do. Does How much of that matches up to him, do you think? Pretty much everything. I think particularly, for example, about the controlling and the jealousy, the catalyst for a lot of this was apparently a fight he had with his ex who and, and the mother of his child. Yeah. And it, she had actually at times been in homes where she was trying to get away from him, been in shelters to try to avoid him. And he had hit her. He had, if I remember correctly, run over her with a car at one point, which was really telling since that's what he did here to the people in the parade. Yeah. The, so I can definitely see that being part of it. Um, as far as the hypersensitivity to criticism, I want to show you another clip later and see if you think that's still true. Certainly, okay. I mean, certainly he was fairly prideful about his ability to do legal arguments, <laughs> which yeah. did not always work out for him. <laughs> it, wasn't yeah. always, it wasn't always right. But I and again, again, just that. pick up on your point there, Lee. From from the bits that I've seen, when he's trying to argue his legal case. He's not just somebody who's chancing it, who thinks, you know, I'm going to try my best. Maybe it'll work. Maybe I'll get away with it and you make, make a mistake here or there. That's not the flavor I'm getting from him. I, I get the kind of feeling that he's almost delusional. You know, he's so kind of egotistical that he actually believes that he's, you know, got strong legal arguments. And if the court doesn't accept them, then it's part of his, it builds into his kind of paranoid construct. Do you know what I mean? So it's not somebody who's trying and failing in his mind. It's somebody who's succeeding, but the court... Uh, uh, won't accept his uh, his arguments. Yeah, I remember a point at which you know he kept asking about this subject matter jurisdiction and does the court you know the court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction and you haven't proven it, which made no sense. I mean, it, it legally that that doesn't I that doesn't fit in this particular case. But despite the fact that he kept arguing it, and she and finally she or maybe not finally she wrote down an opinion with detail about why she thought it. And she said, it's in the opinion. And he said, well, I hadn't read the opinion, something like that. And she has some, a deputy give him a copy of the opinion. Well, he stands up at the end, of, the jury's walking out, and he just tears it into shreds without reading it. So that yeah. did make me wonder, does he really think he's right? Or is he just going to make this argument, you know, till the cows come home? He's not, he's not letting it go. It doesn't matter what anybody tells him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It does sound like the latter, doesn't it? Uh, and again, uh at the risk of repeating myself, I, th I think that fits in all with his paranoid personality disorder. Yeah. He definitely does not trust. It's not just the attorneys, but in general, the la one of the last two videos in particular, you're going to see some of that. I, th I think you'll really latch onto that because I, I think clearly he does have those paranoid tendencies. I don't sure. think there's any arguing that he doesn't. Yeah. Well, let's layer in yet another video and uh, see what you think. Call yourself a judge as much as bias you could put up in here. Don't even tell the jury the truth. You got no integrity whatsoever. None. None. He said all that at the beginning, man. Like, I don't even want to be in here that much longer. Just do what you got to do so I can get up out of here. I'm tired of being in the courtroom that has no integrity whatsoever. How can you even call yourself Mr. a judge? Brooks, I need to make 
a record of, of I some I need things. to make a record too. You don't when am to, I going to get the chance to do that? I'm finna, I'm finna he hasn't anyway, sat so down do for you the better part of two hours. All you, want. you can hold me in contempt all you want. Mr. Brooks, you're being it taken no to the next no Mr. Brooks. Don't try to address me Thank like you. that like we cool. You don't have no integrity. How can you even call yourself a judge? Making tacky agreements, being biased, judicial misconduct, trying to steal somebody's system. So, <laughs> yet more. Tell me yeah. what you're thinking. Uh, so, I, I, I'm just quite shocked that this was allowed. Uh, again, going, going back to my experience of courts in the UK, um, uh, again, I, you don't see this behavior very often at all. I've only seen it a couple of times, but it's been shut down immediately. Like, I can't see that happening. I can't see him getting out more than two sentences in that state. He would just be pounced upon by the court staff and taken away. Um, so you've got to wonder why Judge Doro has allowed that. Is it because she can't stand up for herself? I mean, would she even make Judge if that was the case? I think that's doubtful. I think she's trying to give him a chance so that she doesn't appear to be, you know, um, uh, uh, abandoning his rights. Um, but I'm surprised that it got got to that point because you can't speak to a judge like that. You know, judges have ultimate power. Right. right. And they kind of, I don't want to speak ill of my colleagues considering I work with them every day, but they have this air of kind of slight pomposity and authority. And if they even, you know, if there's any kind of indication that they're not being respected, they usually jump on that immediately. I've never seen anything like that either. I don't think it's a US UK difference. I think that Judge Doro made a very specific decision here that what she was going to do was let him do whatever he wanted to do in the confines of moving him to the other room, but let him go all the way through trial representing himself. And she was not going to stop that no matter what. And she felt like that would in the long run, best keep him in jail, no appeal, no coming back to her courtroom. I think, I, I wonder if she regretted that decision. I mean, I wonder if she, you know, by the end of the trial, wish she had taken a different course, but that's how she started. And yeah. I, I think she did it thinking that that would make sense, thinking yeah. that she would be able to use that to help the citizens she it represents. And, but I don't know, I, I think it went really, really, really far. And because it was broadcast, I think it really does hurt the impression about justice in the US, justice in general. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, I suppose it's, it's hard once you've started off letting somebody speak uh, and say almost whatever they want at the beginning of the trial to shut it, shut it down later on. I suppose the other thing that crossed my mind is that if she had shut him down earlier and if she had done what I think the vast majority of judges would have done, then I'm 100% sure that it would have tied into his paranoid and conspir conspiratorial kind of ideas. So he wouldn't have acknowledged, even the tiniest bit of him wouldn't acknowledge that he was being rude and that he needed to be shut up. I'm sure that he would have thought that this was, you know, part of part of some massive conspiracy and that the judges already made their mind and, you know, all of this, all of this stuff. So it's, it's like a, a no win situation for the judge, really. Right. And I, I do think she made a choice early on and stuck with it. I mean, she made the choice. I'm going to I think this is a way to prevent an appeal. I'm going to do this. I, I can deal with it. I can put up with it for two, three weeks and, you know, let it happen. It yeah, I think that's part of it. Yeah, I, I also think that probably, I mean, I'm kind of speculating here, but probably she wants justice for all the victims. Mm -hmm. So she wants the victims to see that it's been a completely open and fair trial and also to see what a nasty kind of difficult man he is as well. Right. That is true. It definitely came across. I mean, because she let all that play out. If, if he had been silenced and just a lawyer stood up it would have been a very different impression of who he was yeah, yeah no question about that i mean i suppose the other way to think about it despite everything that we've just said is like if you if you kill six people in, in just 60 you're going to be spending life in prison anyway so there's not i can't imagine any kind of scenario where he's going to get anything less than a full-term sentence than a life tariff so you know what's the, you could argue what's the point of, of any of it right. really right and, you know, so I, th I think she made a very conscious decision and, I, you know, it it may not have played out the way she wanted, but I, I, th I don't think she did it accidentally or because she wasn't strong. I don't think it was just, you know, she didn't exert herself early enough. She made a choice and she could have chosen a different way, but she elected this particular way, thinking that would be best for her, her people. Yeah.
I've got a question for you. So this this is all happening in California. Am I correct in saying that? No, it's in um, Waukesha, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, apologies. And um, is there a death penalty there? No, there's not. Okay. But had it been another state, certain other states, right. then that would have been taken into consideration. Okay, right. That's interesting. Right. So um, she can give him, you know, multiple life sentences, you know, hundreds of years on top of that, but not the death penalty. And the number of years she gives on top of it is kind of irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, it is. This yeah. was sort of his last hurrah as far as, you know, anything exciting that will ever happen to him yeah. again, really. But you do you don't get the you don't get the impression, or I don't at least, that he's using this as a platform to kind of, you know, get some attention or to kind of show off. It doesn't really feel like that. It, it, it's like what I was saying before, he feels so kind of invested and paranoid in, in into his beliefs that, yeah, it doesn't feel like he's trying to show off. It feels that he really thinks that he deserves some sort of acquittal or uh, an easier sentence. Right. I, I agree. I, I think that's true. Well, now I want to show you one of the, uh, just a brief excerpt. All of these have been heavily cut, so we could have our conversation and not spend sure. the whole time on the video. But this is an interview of Daryl Brooks' mother with TMJ4 News. And she's being asked about the letter she wrote to the judge and why she wrote it. The letter said, they quoted from it, and the letter said, you know, my son isn't capable of representing himself, and you need mm -hmm. to know that. So I thought it was really interesting what she said, and, and I'm curious how this interplays. You'll see what I mean. Okay. To help Daryl, I knew that he was not mentally capable of presenting himself as his own attorney. What has led to Daryl's behavior? His mental illness, not being medicated. How do you think he's going to handle the proceedings? I'm going to, and I hate to say this, you're going to see manic, full-blown. That's what you're going to see. Mm. So um, his mother is saying that he essentially I think she would be saying he's bipolar right using yeah. the manic right, and so yeah. she's saying he's bipolar and he's unmedicated which might have led to the actions both in the parade and I'm asking um, could it have led to what we saw in court does that seem to fit yeah bipolar? yeah I, I mean I hope the answer is no because if he is bipolar or medicated then there's a real chance that you know justice isn't actually being served if he's not criminally culpable. So I will answer that question, but before, just for your viewers, I'm going to talk, give you a bit of background to everything. Right, so Daryl Brooks is paranoid. I don't think anyone's doubting that. There's a couple of different possible reasons, right? So there's either a personality disorder, as I keep saying, paranoid personality disorder, which is completely ingrained. So it is basically a description of somebody's personality traits. It's part of them. It's not a separate mental illness right? Then you can have actual mental illnesses. So the two most common ones that would fit this presentation would be a delusional disorder and schizophrenia. So delusional disorder is where you have usually one fixed belief or a set of beliefs around something that you strongly believe. So like you're being poisoned by radioactive waves or the coronavirus is being covered up by the government uh, or that there are, you know, um, alien high functioning society secret society um what's the illuminati stuff like that so it's just it's not that you're generally paranoid about all of life it's just one spe specific delusional belief and outside of that you're pretty normal so you're not necessarily that hostile or paranoid outside of that i don't think daryl brooks has got that because he seems to be kind of paranoid in all aspects of his personality all the time argumentative against everybody rather than fixed having a fixed belief in one thing and then you've got schizophrenia which uh, is a serious mental illness where people can have actual psychotic symptoms. So paranoid delusions, which are usually bizarre. So they wouldn't be just that the judge is, is against me. They, I mean, some of the schizophrenia might think that, but they would also have actual delusion beliefs com completely outside of reality. Like an alien is putting messages into my brain or my next door neighbor is a pedophile. Uh, plus they tend to hear voices as well. The other thing about schizophrenia is it's very often associated with cognitive decline. So the average person, especially with severe schizophrenia is quite sort of slow in their thinking they're not sort of quick-witted uh they wouldn't be as cut as daryl uh, brooks is that's something else that i noticed about him i'm not saying it's impossible but 
99% of the time they wouldn't because, uh, you know, all of these negative symptoms, lack of energy, social withdrawal, um, lack of sort of volition or motivation, they wouldn't be going to the gym every day. So those are three possibilities. As I said right from the beginning, I think he would be paranoid personality disorder. But I have to say, and I think after hearing that clip from about from his mother, which I've not seen before, I have to say it's, it's less clear cut than I originally expected. I think he's most likely to be that of those three things, but it's not completely inconceivable that he could have one of the other two. And if he has one of the other two, then it's possible that he's not actually fit to plead. Um, I think it really boils down to the thing that I said right at the beginning of, of this interview, which is, is he being argumentative because he's a difficult, horrible, um, challenging, narcissistic, arrogant man, and that's his own personality, in which case he is fit to plead and fit to represent himself. He's just doing a terrible job. Which is, I think, which is on balance what I think is the case, or is this are there actual underlying delusions that haven't really come out that have kind of been sort of missed, and we're just seeing the surf surface of it? In which case, he literally can't contain himself, and he's he's so uh, over these these this, these paranoid delusions are so overbearing that he actually cannot. He's not capable of following evidence or following conversation without losing his temper in which case if that's the case and i think on balance it's not although it's quite close to the cost then you could argue that he's not fit to plead in which case he shouldn't even be on trial in the first place okay well um i want you to take a listen then to another video this is an interview with uh his mother after the verdict came in to understand mental illness and understand people who are mentally ill are hurting. They're trapped. And a lot of them don't know the way I will show compassion. The families who have loved ones that are suffering from mental illness, a lot of them are ashamed to even talk about it. Those people need help more than anything. Seek out treat treatment where there is. Speak up for them, be an advocate for them. Do you think he can get help in? in no very little help is done for individuals who are incarcerated with mental illness. That's why I wanted him to go to a hospital where he can still get treatment, but that won't be. Hmm. So I've not seen that clip either. A couple of things jump out to me. I, I really don't think it is that clear cut. I still think on balance that this, this is a, an issue with his natural personality structure as opposed to a separate mental illness. Uh, obviously, a, a non-expert, a non-clinician, would, even if it's his mother, would not necessarily understand the difference between those two things. A couple of things I'd say is that it, when, when I would do an assessment on a, a defendant who's committed any kind of serious violence, one of the biggest things I rely on is the medical records and their history of presenting with mental illness. So usually somebody, if especially if they've got a mental illness like schizophrenia, they'll be going in and out of hospital, especially if it's quite severe, and they won't be able to function. Now, I know Darrell Brooks has some kind of history of mental illness, but he's never, to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, ever been like hospitalized or sectioned. So, I mean, there's two ways to look at that. It's either because he doesn't have a history of mental illness, and this is, as I keep saying, an issue with his personality. It's not unfeasible that he just didn't present to services you know if he comes from particular communities who uh, where there's a stigma against mental illness or if he lives a pretty chaotic lifestyle where uh, it's not even picked up then it's, it's it's possible that he does have a history of mental illness but it's not been noticed the other thing and this is an uncomfortable thing to say but i, I believe it to be true is sometimes the image of the individual um, guides or clouds our judgment as members of the public about whether they should be found to have a mental illness. So this man has done something that's absolutely horrific to complete random st strangers. We know that he's got a history of, of quite extreme views, including, you know, very racist views. We know that he's got a history of domestic violence and, and misogyny. So it is is more comfortable, let me put it that way, for the public to think that he doesn't have a and mental illness that needs to be treated. He's just a nasty piece of work. So he's got personality issues and should be tried normally. That's the more comfortable thing to think. But if you remember before, you, you mentioned somebody like, or I mentioned somebody like Andrea Yates, who also did something very horrific. You know, she killed five of her own children. But 
I think it's easier to sympathize with her because she's young. Well, not because she's young, because she's female. She's not antisocial. She's not a nasty, argumentative person. She clearly is overtly tortured by these delusions that she speaks about openly. She's not trying to defend her actions. I think that's another big thing. So Daryl Brooke is trying to make every excuse under the sun, whereas Andrea Andrea Yates immediately admitted to what she did. In fact, she phoned the police herself because she's in this psychotic world where she, she thought she did the right thing. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that I, I do this all the time in my line of work. I have to really extract what I think of the person or the, or the image that they portray versus the actual clinical issues and, and diagnosis. And yeah, I just go back to what I said before. I think he's near the cusp. I think he's, I think he's close to to feasibly having a mental illness, uh, as opposed to a personality disorder, which is a, a worrying thought, really. Well, if it gives you any comfort, there were a couple of things that happened. One is the judge said she had reviewed four different psychiatric reports in making her conclusions. It wasn't really clear where those came from, like when and why was he evaluated? That part wasn't clear. But she all there was also a comment by the prosecution that he'd been repeatedly incarcerated and at no point had there ever been a suggestion before that he was incompetent to stand trial, that no okay. one had ever suggested that he lacked the ability to just show up and be present and understand what okay. was happening. So that goes back to what you were saying. I just wanted us to look at, you know, all sides of it and kind of, and, and get your full opinion based on mm. as much information as we could fit into an hour or so. Yeah. I'll just say a couple of, a couple of things in closing. So in the UK, when we do a fitness to plead assessment, you have to have two independent psychiatrists. So the judge never goes on one opinion. It always be, it's always a minimum of two. And I would say if I was instructed for this, this would be one of the rare cases where I'd be glad that there was another psychiatrist completely independent from me doing right. assessment because I don't want to get it wrong. And I think it is, it is sitting kind of in a gray area. I don't think it's that obvious to me what's going on. So, and you probably think those are the two surprise videos. Those are not even the two. <laughs> videos. So you have to hang on. There's more to okay. come. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> so, um, okay. So a lot of people are going to be talking about, um, the idea that they think he's a narcissist. I think that's sort of a quick diagnosis that a lot of people are familiar with. And so, you know, they'll come up with that. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. And I want to show this next video in that connection. Of the, of the yeah. Wisconsin statutes. The 10th count of the info. And I should stop and explain. So what happened was he'd been holding this, uh, he was muted. So he'd been holding up an objection sign as she was reading the jury instructions to the jury. Trial has concluded, but the jury hasn't deliberated yet. So he holds it up, he waves it, and I guess his arms got tired. So this was his solution. Information in this case charges that Darrell E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Maura Gilchrist under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to So what are, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> I, had, I had a specific thought and I'm just really curious if you had the same one. Okay. Uh, I mean, clearly he's, attention, he's an attention seeker, right? And clearly he's extremely arrogant. Now, as to, to, to question, as to the question is whether he's a narcissist, and this is something I've considered uh, before because somebody else asked me on, an, on another channel, right? So I'll, just, I'll very briefly explain. So there's narcissist as in the adjective. So somebody who's a bit full of themselves, who likes being the center of attention, who likes admiration, is a narcissist. But that's not the same as narcissistic personality disorder. So, not, so pers a narcissist, MPD, is the same as all personality disorders, is when that trait is so, so powerful and strong that it dominates over your life and it ruins your interactions with people and the relationships of people around you. So off the top of my head, you can have a teenage, pretty teenage girl who loves being on Instagram. She's a narcissist, A-list actor or celebrity who's a bit full of themselves, Hollywood actor, he's a narcissist, but they're not necessarily got the personality disorder. It's just part of their, their makeup. So just, just very quickly to tell you what um, narcissistic personality disorder, what the traits are, they have like an exaggerated sense of self-importance. They're kind of entitled. They want excessive admiration. 
they think of themselves as superior, even though they don't have the achievements and they exaggerate their talents. Um, they kind of fantasize about success and power. They monopolize conversations or belittle people. And they have an inability or unwillingness to recognize the, the needs and feelings of other people. And they often are envious of other people and they believe other people are envious of them. Now, even when I'm going through them, I, I completely recognize that Daryl Brooks has some of those features. But there's a feel that I get from working with uh, dozens of people with narcissistic personality disorder, which is that they have this, uh, the, the most important character trait is that they love to be admired. They are kind of the person that's always dominating the conversation, not angry, not shouting over you, but kind of, you know, it's, I'm sure you know people like this. I'm sure all your viewers do. You come along and say, oh, I've had a really hard day because, you know, I had an argument with my boss. And before you've even got to the end of the sentence, well, I had an argument with my boss two weeks ago and, and this, my boss did blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? Or, like they, they just, they dominate because they want to be the center of attention and want to be admired by everybody. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. I do not get the sense at all that Daryl Brooks cares whether he's being admired by people. I think even though he has some of those traits, his actions are driven by paranoia, complete disrespect of the court system and his own uh, feeling that he's being victimized. Whereas somebody with narcissistic PD would want everybody, including the judge, to admire them. So they'd be charming. They'd be cool. They would be they'd be making little jokes in front of the courtroom. They would be, you know, possibly winning some arguments, but not by shouting and dominating, just being by being kind of charming and manipulating and kind of a bit smarmy. That's exactly why I included that clip, because to me, it seemed like such a utilitarian, yet somewhat demeaning thing to do. You know, like, OK, I'm just going to hold it here. I'm going to make my point. I'm committed to the point. But it didn't seem like something that people would admire him for. I mean, and it seemed like he didn't care. And that seemed uh, that seemed unlike the desire to be admired. And yeah. so that's why yeah. I included that. I was curious if you thought the same thing and what your opinion was. Yeah. So a narcissist is that, I mean, you know, one of the features I said is that they dominate the conversation, right? And Daryl Brooks clearly was dominating the conversation, but <laughs> that's, he's doing it by shouting and arguing over points. A narcissist makes it all about me. So they want to continue the conversation. They enjoy the conversation. It just has to be about me because I'm the most important person in the room. Daryl Brooks definitely has a sense of entitlement. No question about that, but not because he wants to be admired. It's because he believes that he's right and everybody else is worthless and wrong. Right. Um, and okay, so let me add the last two surprise videos. Um, the first one, you should know that during the last day, um, I, I believe it was as the jury was coming back or right before, Daryl Brooks made a claim that he had electric shock ankle bracelets on and that those were able to shock him and he was complaining about that and that that had been hidden from the jury. So the judge goes on the record and says, and they just finished a discussion about how she says, she asks him, do you oppose this? Do you want this? She's deciding whether or not to make the subpoenas that have been issued public. And she can, he won't respond. So she finally says, okay, well, I'm going to make all the subpoenas public. It's the end of the trial. That's what I'm going to do. This is a hearing after the trial. So this is a hearing that just happened yesterday. And so she says, all right, I'm going to make those all public. She said, now I want to put on the record that I've had photographs made and so forth about these restraints that were on him during the trial to prove that these were not electric. They, they were not shocking restraints. There was nothing that, about them that would have been painful or harmful to him. And so I'm, I want every, I want that to be on the record. She, but she says, but I'm going to keep that under seal because I don't want other defendants to know about it and to know about the restraints we use because it might be a public risk. So that's the context. Very, very, very unfair. And it's dishonorable to get on a record and not tell the truth. I'm not trying to dishonor you, Your Honor. I'm not trying to disrespect you. I'm not trying to disrespect your court. I just want the truth to be told. That should not be sealed. If, if, if everything else could be open to the public, then the public should know that I had a shock device on my ankles that was purposely not shown to the jury or to the public. They should know that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. I disagree wholeheartedly with your well, characterization. Well, it's, it's not true. No, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure there's cameras rolling right now because there are always cameras rolling. 
There's always audio on. Mr. Brooks, I need there's to public, move on to there's scheduling. There's public in the courtroom. I had a shock device on my ankles, and they purposely did not want to show that to you guys or to the jury. Everybody that came to this courtroom seen that I had a chair right here, even though I had no counsel. What is the reason for me to have a chair right here? Right. So okay. let me just get this get this straight, Lee. So he does have ankle he does have ankle restraints, but they're not the shocked ones, and he's claiming that they are. Right. And then the judge right. is took a took a picture, but she doesn't want there to be public knowledge that they sometimes use shock bracelets. So she's saying let's keep that bit under wraps, and he's protesting against her not letting out all of the entire truth. Did I get that she, right? She went into a fair amount of detail about what they looked like. And that she had pictures, and it was the configuration and how they're wrapped, and they kind of hide it behind a black cover in the front of the table so yeah. that people can't see and learn how to detach it or whatever. Oh, okay. And so that was what she was talking about. Okay. But he, that will make sense to me, but he believes, it seems, that he does have shock bracelets on even after the judge has given him those reassurances. I've it certainly seemed to me like he really yeah. believed it. He said someone yeah. had told him that. And he exactly. seems like the kind of person who could be told something false, fully believe it, and you could never dissuade him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it keeps coming back to the same diagnosis that, I, that right. I'm, I've been saying right from the beginning, paranoid personality disorder. So they take neutral comments, gestures, or even pieces of information. And when it fits their conspiracy theories, they kind of believe it, basically. Yeah. I really thought that played into your your theory about the paranoia because it really does seem to be related to that yeah and uh, like why does he care if it's public knowledge or not doesn't really make sense to me either he believes there's a couple of possibilities either he wants to help the public and he, he believes that the public deserves to know everything but he seems quite entitled and quite selfish to me to want that or he genuinely believes that he might be shocked at any point and he wants the public to know in case he does get shocked which is kind of in itself extremely paranoid because why would they shock him for no reason when he knows his camera's on and it's such a high profile right. trial? Yeah, that's true. But it definitely does seem, you know, very paranoid. And she laid a very specific record about how they did this and that and they wrapped it and it was all a soft restraint and it was so he couldn't leave the table or I guess run out of the courtroom or hurt anybody else in the courtroom. I did think about that as, I mean, the prosecutors are sitting right beside him and he really seemed to have a lot of issues with women. And sometimes it'd be the female prosecutor sitting right beside him. And I thought of that. Yeah. So, um, all right, well, I'm going to throw in this last video real twist. I'm just curious what you'll make of it. So okay. this comes for, it's an excerpt from a 2012 documentary called Crystal Darkness. And there was a YouTube channel called Just the Receipts that found and posted it. I'm going to link to both of those below. Now, this is, believe it or not, Daryl Brooks was in the documentary. He's talking from jail about his meth addiction. And it's a very interesting find. So definitely, folks, check out those two channels, Just the Receipts um, and the Crystal Darkness documentary. And I'll link them below. So let me um, go ahead and let you watch this video. I thought I would just be this wonderful father. You actually become the drug. Not even a human being. Basically, that's, that's how I felt. Like I wasn't, I wasn't a human anymore. I was just something, something vile, disgusting. Despicable. Oh man, if I was 15 again, <laughs> if I was 15 and had most of the opportunities that these kids have now, I would probably be. Door flips down this thing here. So I'll be interested to get your reaction. Um, I had, I had two different reactions. One to what he was saying at first and one to his comment about the 15 year olds. Yeah. So anyway. I'm curious about, <laughs> about what you have to say. Yeah, so I suppose I had a couple of thoughts. The first thing was, is his meth addiction completely separate to his current presentation and his personality, or is there some kind of link? So that was 10 years ago. It's very feasible that somebody could like have the propensity to be quite paranoid, like they might grow up in a violent 
neighborhood environment, in environment it might just be part of their natural temperament as a, as a child and then you throw in years of hard drugs and it can definitely add to a sense of overall paranoia you know it's no secret that meth causes paranoia i'm assuming that Darrell brooks has been meth free during his trial because he's been you know he'll be on remand in prison so that's my assumption so it's not something like a drug-induced psychosis which which is a possibility for somebody that uses those kinds of hard drugs so that's my first thought and the second thought was that even what he said if i had the same opportunities as most of these 15 year olds had i would have done so much better even though he is being slightly insightful to a degree and taking some responsibility it's also a sentiment that's kind of flavoured with paranoia, isn't it? So he's basically indirectly saying that, you know, not it's my fault because I've taken crystal mess for years, but I didn't have the same opportunity that kids get nowadays. So even even in his moment of epiphany, there's a there's an underlying paranoia that, that stood out to me. And my thought too was, what do 15-year-olds get that he didn't get? I mean, I don't really see some, you know, large you know, benefit to being 15 in 2012 that wasn't true when he was 15. So I thought that everything was sounding good up until then. And then that seemed more like a, yeah, you know, it's not my fault. I just didn't get as much as these people did. And that seemed unlikely to be true. I didn't think, you know, all 15 year olds are super entitled compared to what he used to have. That seemed unlikely. And again, uh, I, sorry for repeating myself so many times, but, you know, di- denying responsibility, uh, blaming other people all the time, classic paranoid personality disorder. Yeah. So summing it all up, you know, having looked at all of that, sort of give me your thoughts about Daryl Brooks and what you think happened at the trial. What what happened with the parade? Anything like that? Yeah. So I think we've, we're seeing a very disturbed individual. Um, he has a long criminal history, doesn't he? So even before the trial, he has charges for weapons, for battery, assaulting an officer, stealing cars, drugs, firearms. So he's he's, he's a a pro-criminogenic person who who has had a very chaotic lifestyle, meth addiction, everything thrown into the mix. I should say, even though I've repeatedly used, and I stand by my diagnosis of of paranoid personality disorder, the one diagnosis that I haven't mentioned, which I think is is very relevant, is antisocial personality disorder. So the reason I haven't mentioned that is because that's more, I think, about his previous actions. So somebody who's antisocial tends to be a career criminal, they tend to be impulsive, aggressive, they lack empathy, they don't care about the law, they don't care about the rights of other of other people, they don't learn from their mistakes, so they tend to go into prison over and over again and, and don't improve their behaviour. So I just want to make that clear, I think he's got that, I just haven't mentioned it because that's his previous behaviour, we've been talking about his current behaviour, where it's more about his paranoia. Um, so that's what I think is going on. I, I feel after seeing, so I, I've seen maybe half of the clips you showed me before and half of them I hadn't. Uh, the ones particularly when uh, regarding his mother worrying about his mental health and saying he's got mental illness have made me feel a little bit uncomfortable because even though I st- stick by my original proposal, I also don't think it's completely um, uh, out of the question that he might actually have an underlying mental illness. I know he's been diagnosed by, psych- by psychiatrists, but not everyone gets it right all the time. And some people are just really hard to diagnose because they're so kind of guarded with their actual symptoms that, that it's really hard to tease it out. So I don't think it's that clear cut case. I think he's, he's sitting somewhere near the fence. Um, and finally, my last thought would be I've never seen anybody have that level of vitriol and disrespect to a judge and it not been shut down. So uh, that just is bizarre and fascinating to watch. I completely agree with that. I, I want to talk a little bit, though, about the fact that even if he had a bipolar diagnosis, that doesn't necessarily mean that he walks free, right? It doesn't mean he was not responsible for killing six people and injuring 60. Is that true? Yeah, that's right. So what would if he if he did have something like bipolar and if he was cl- uh, clinically manic, then you'd get a forensic psychiatrist such as myself and they would have to look at all the evidence and prove that he was, first of all, that he was actually floridly manic. So when I say all the evidence, I'm talking about all CCTV, witness statements to anybody that saw him around uh, like at the time or immediately before, police interview, transcripts for when he was very first arrested. Um, and he, after you've proved that, if he was to get a psychiatric defence, you have to prove that he either, is what I was saying before, he either didn't know what he was doing 
or he didn't know what he was doing was wrong to get a not guilty by reason of insanity. In the UK, we also have diminished responsibility, which is what it sounds like. So it's it's not that your responsibility is completely taken away. You're considered culpable, but only partially culpable. And again, there's other medical legal criteria, but you have to have this mental illness in the background. So in his case, I don't think it can be argued that he didn't know what he's doing or he didn't know what it was wrong, even if he was manic. A stretch is possible to argue that he had a diminished uh, degree of responsibility if he was manic at the time, but we don't know that for a fact. And there were a lot of facts, I think, that would point to him being fully aware. For example, he touted the fact that whoever was in the car, he didn't admit it was he, but was blowing the horn. Well, that shows that, you know, people need to get out of the way, that they could yeah. get hurt if they don't. When he when the car, when he finally crashed, he jumped out of the car and ran off and he ran through yeah. back neighborhoods and beside houses and got caught on various ring cameras and things like that. Yeah. All of which suggests he knew he had done something wrong. And then he hid out in a children's playhouse and they finally found him there. He did not confess when the police found him and he lied to them about whether he had driven to town in that red SUV. So there were a lot of things he did that suggested, you know, he was covering his tracks because he knew for a fact that he had done something wrong. Yeah, couldn't couldn't agree with you more, Lee. I think that's one of the, the biggest telltale signs is somebody's behavior immediately after trying to cover, cover themselves up or escape. So going back to Andrea Yates, I keep mentioning this case just because it's a prototype uh, case that gets a finding of not guilty by reason of insanity. She phones the police. She doesn't deny any of her actions. She doesn't even understand the concept that she's killed her children. Daryl Brooks is the opposite of those things. You know, he's trying to escape. He's trying to run off. So you, I don't think you could, there's any argument that he he did know what he was doing was wrong. Well, absolutely fantastic interview. I cannot thank you enough. It was a lot of fun. And uh, you have a book out. I want to talk a little bit about that. In Two Minds, Stories of Murder, Justice, and Recovery from a Forensic Psychiatrist. Ah, you have it right there. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for having me on as a, a guest. I, I really enjoyed Absolutely. the interview. It's a fascinating case. Uh, yeah, so it, it I wrote this book and it came out in March of this year. Paperback will be out next March. And it's basically my professional memoirs of being a forensic psychiatrist. So I talk about my own cases, although I have to kind of anonymize them. A couple of them are actually not that dissimilar to, um, to Andrew Yates. Uh, and it's just a little bit about my journey, about about how individual cases shaped me as a psychiatrist, and it is a little bit silly and a little bit funny, I like to think. Okay. Well, um, I want everybody to subscribe to Dr. Das's channel, which is a psych for sore minds, and if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please subscribe here too, and we will look forward to seeing you in the next video. Absolutely. I'd love to come on again. All the best, Lee. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you.